we're going to be starting now, and uh, I want to welcome everyone here to Ambiotica. If you don't have a seat, you might want to come in and find one. There's a few more. A little room up front here. Okay, well, uh, we're so glad everyone's here. Thank you for coming to the fifth Ambiotica. This is a special event that uh, has been a series. Uh, we haven't done one since uh, 2007, but uh, this is our opportunity to combine our creative uh, vision uh, with some thoughtful discourse, uh, starting off our evening. Um, we, as most of you know, we will continue the evening uh, at 10 o'clock at the Anand Gallery, which is around the corner. And we have some wonderful music and um, various attractions over there later. But uh, I'm glad that everyone has shown up early because this is the real, real treat of the evening. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome two amazing figures here to San Francisco. Um, this is our opportunity to kind of learn from, see whose shoulders we stand on in some ways. Um, with Ralph Metzner and John Allen. Um, and maybe we'll just welcome them. Um, uh, the impetus uh, for this evening was the publication of, of two books. Um, uh, John Allen, who uh, Tango is going to come up in a few minutes and um, tell us a little bit more about John. But uh, he is the original visionary who conceived the idea of Biosphere 2. And for those of you who may not be familiar with this uh, pioneering project, you'll, you'll know a lot more after this evening. Um, but uh, John's background is um, quite fascinating. He's a true Renaissance man and uh, has made contributions in many different spheres. Um, uh, Ralph Messner, many of you may know, um, was involved at the um, early uh, crystal of the psychedelic culture that we now all take for granted, um, back working with um, Ram Das, Richard Alpert, and Timothy Leary back at Harvard. And um, there's been a lot of coverage of this fabled era and uh, the many stories surrounding um, the work of these gentlemen. Um, but this is finally an opportunity for Ralph and Ram Das and many others uh, to share uh, their point of view and their insights um, on that formative era. Uh, so these are the books, Me and the Biospheres by John Allen and Birth of a Psychedelic Culture um, by Ralph Metzner and Ram Das. And Gary Bravo was instrumental in uh, helping put this uh, volume together. We'll be um, selling books out back here and um, having uh, autograph an autograph session uh, from 10 to 10.30. So make sure if you get a chance to, to pick up copies of the books. So, um, Tango, would you like to uh, give us a little introduction to Synergetic Press? Um, Deborah Perry Snyder is the publisher of Synergetic Press. They're located out in Santa Fe, and uh, she has uh, been the driving force uh, behind both of these projects, and in fact, uh, was the catalyst for for this event tonight. So I'd like to introduce Tango for a minute. Well, Synergetic Press has got a very appropriate name for what brought together all of us here this evening. And I've had the extraordinary opportunity to know John Allen and work with him for over 30 years on various different ecological projects and theatrical e expeditions. 
and then culminating in Bias for Two, where I lived and worked for 10 years with John, and I was very, very proud to be able to bring out his memoir, Spanning This Vast, a Diverse Man's Life. So, um, uh, Ralph, I had the great fortune of meeting only a few years ago, and by synchronicity, like it's all been going on now, he was on, my, on, on our back porch, saying, oh yes, well I do have a book that you might be interested in. And that brought me to uh, this next journey that took me through uh, from biospherics to the world of psychedelics. So tonight we are conjuring a Noah's sphere and uh, looking at the synergy between these two different fields of experience uh, with uh, two men who have been a long way down the path in that journey. And Michael Gosney, who I'm so glad to reconnect again with, I cannot tell you when I proposed this crazy idea and you said, oh, you know, I do that sort of thing. <laughs> how, uh, how thrilled I was with the opportunity to be able to come to San Francisco for this kind of manifestation. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Okay. okay. Are you ready, John? <laughs> Johnny Dolphin in San Francisco. Uh, well, I would uh, like to mention in this noosphere uh, is intimately con uh, connected with this union of uh, higher states of consciousness, Ralph's uh, field, and biospheric. Uh, the noosphere idea was developed, in fact, by uh, Bernonsky of Russia. Speak into the microphone. There you go. Go ahead, John. You're good. All right. Maria, would you adjust the microphone? Yes. Speak. You're fine. You just need to turn it off. Okay. Into the microphone. Just speak. Oh, I just stay closer to it. Okay. All right. All right. Now, now I got it. So anyway. He defined the noosphere uh, as an emergent, by the way, the word sphere is not an intellectual's word. It relates to the fact that uh, the Earth is more or less a sphere. It's, it's actually an oblate spheroid, but it's pretty close to a sphere. So all of the things that uh, are dependent on the geosphere are literally a sphere. It's, this is not, uh, you know, some metaphor. And so there are many, many properties. So there's. Uh, the, the noosphere, he said, will be composed of individuals who synthesize inside themselves the, uh, basically the ethnosphere, the world of art and culture, the technosphere, the world of techniques, and the biosphere. And he thought the noosphere would occur. Now, there was a mystical interpretation put on that, but uh, as the original scientific historical one, was a, this is a reality to Noah's fear, that there's are more and more individuals that in their life integrate uh, art, uh, science, and uh, philosophy. Because our, our culture, the cultural barriers that kept us apart are now into an ethnosphere. Now the, uh, actually the Russians called Biosphere 2 Noah's Fear 1. And they were uh, very, very chief consultants on it. They were the only people in the scientific world at the National Academy level that uh, uh, pushed total systems thinking. Now, in America, we went the opposite route. Everything was broken down. As one person put it, the science was dismembered into lots of little case studies here, here, and here. Anyway, this was a, a preface I did for me in the biospheres. Now, I know this is not I in the biospheres. I, who knows who I am, or who, where I am, or that. But me is located in the biosphere. And they called it me and the biospheres because for a while it was located in both biosphere one and biosphere two. I delighted in the reality, when I was a kid, of what I later learned to call nature. I smelled the fresh faded dirt in spring and ran barefoot over grass and clay and small rocks. 
I slid into sun-warm summer wallows with the big tough skin boars and sows that snuffled about in my grandfather's spacious hog lot. I loved the big branch tall cottonwoods that flanked the quick sanded river from whose safe height squirrels cautiously peered down at me. I sat contentedly watching the stinging red ants scurrying in and out of their sun-baked barren mounds that hid the queen. I dazzled myself by chasing butterflies and running down dirt roads chased by a cloud of midges. I dipped fruit jars into ponds to catch pollywogs and watched them metamorphose into frogs, picked potato bugs off my grandmother's green plants and marveled at their increase. Same for crawdads in small creeks. I sat on my haunches for hours with grandmother's Rhode Island red chickens, listening to the hens bragging when they laid an egg and watching the glossy feathered roosters strut around, their proud combs waving. I felt connected to every living thing eating and being eaten and breathing in and out the same air. Worms fascinated me because they would eat me after my death. Sharks and tigers fascinated me because they would coolly eat me alive if they could catch me. Enduring the same hunger-satisfying, delicious taste I did when I ate the crisp thighs and tender white meat of a chicken. My grandmother could wring the necks of two chickens at once, whirling one in each hand in opposite directions. Those chickens ran around the backyard with frantic energy, spouting blood until they fell over. She boiled the chickens in a hot water in a big iron pot until they could be easily plucked and cut the brains out of the eggs to serve with scrambled eggs. Uh, yeah, and then um, about 1967, so we put uh, myself and some friends, uh, put together this synergy with the idea of uh, eventually building something with the biosphere. At that time, of course, NASA was very big and we were very small, so as we hoped to get a subcontract, we became really good at it. Uh, and how we would do, put this together would be enterprise theater and ecotechnics, ecology of technics and techniques of ecology. Now notice this leaves out funding. People hate to talk about money. It leaves out funding and it leaves out, uh, basically it meant that we were going to self-finance everything. A series of projects developed the theory and practice of operating complex systems, biospheric, technospheric, and ethnospheric. Now many people don't consider these as a system. They go, oh, there's a culture here and a culture here and a culture there. But in fact, the ethnosphere is as, uh, at least as tightly bound together as the biosphere uh, and the technosphere. You can see all three of these uh, are, are inescapably together. But if you uh, expand your consciousness enough with uh, Ralph's methods or other methods, <laughs> you, you can hold it together. And actually, an increased attention span it's really necessary to get these complex systems. You cannot do them on an if-then, if-then, if-then series of algorithms. Next. Okay, so, well, hate ashbury as we all know, uh, broke down despite a number of attacks and counterattacks and so forth and so on. And some split to Oregon and Washington, some joined the system in the underground, and a handful of us split to New Mexico. So that was uh, where we found a place we could afford, a small ranch. That was what was left of it after the devastation of miners and uh, ranchers. Um, that was a side view of about a year, a year ago. Now, uh, that dome, of, uh, which we started almost the beginning, of, I co-designed with Bucky Fuller. It's a five-eighths dome, and it gets different properties than a half. But the point was we wanted to have advanced technology going with biospherics. For some reason, uh, the idea of biospherics or nature brings out a uh, romantic, uh, sometimes brings out a romantic, uh, anti-technospheric uh, attitude, generally referred to capitalist exploited uh, misuses of the technosphere. Okay, uh, next. 
the, the, this is a, an orchard we planted there. Now, uh, nobody would plant it. If any of you are into orchardry, you would say, this guy has got to be a Jenkins. Why Nobody puts an orchard on a high windswept desert deal. <laughs> but in ecotechnics, that's actually how we studied ecotechnics, was to set up projects that would be uh, impossible with the existing technology and could work that. Actually, we found a place in Malaga that uh, showed us how you can do deserts like that. Uh, then, after we got the ranch going and built up an architectural company and could do things like that, uh, we decided the next step would be to have, uh, to escape the national state system. It's the only one place you can do that, that's on the ocean. And uh, that we would build a ship and access the planet. Uh, at the same time, we would study the geosphere by studying the currents, uh, this and the this, the biosphere, including the marshes and coral reefs. And um, we built that actually very near here, over at the Sixth Avenue Marina in uh, Oakland. <laughs> there it is. And that uh, those uh, uh, timbers you see there, that was an old method of the Malays. There were two great uh, sailing traditions, the Phoenicians and the Malays. Probably. And they would, uh, see, the air, we suspended the ship in the air to work on it and then launched it there. We've got the redwoods, 2 by 12 redwoods, because of the development, which is an inane dis <laughs> discovery word. They should be called destructions, not development. So we would work and get in ahead and pull down these wonderful redwood branches, uh, uh, logs, and timbers. And that's what held the ship up. Yeah. Um, and then sailing, yeah. Now, uh, the ship works the same way. That is to say, it's a combination of enterprise, uh, theater, and ecotechnic. So its various enterprises have included uh, gathering uh, lots of uh, data and studies on coral reefs. Uh, mainly, it uh, trains people to be able-bodied seamen. And then, with that, we said, well, we need to study and become uh, really knowledgeable about every biome on the planet. And one of the most rugged uh, biomes, see, the biosphere is very complex if you're trying to employ the maximum number of intellectuals, and then you can say, study this little ecosystem here, this little ecosystem here, this little ecosystem here. But ecosystems don't really exist any more than quantum. That is to say, once you start studying, they have emergent properties. Now a biome or a bioregion is quite different. If you, uh, that bio, a biome is called a savanna biome. So you could actually walk around with me or by yourself and you would determine that this was the area of that biome because at the end of it, you would hit either thick trees or you would hit a desert. So what we did there then was uh, develop enough knowledge where we could redo this 5,000 acres which had been uh, devastated and overbred. <laughs> the, uh, the photo on the left is why more people don't do this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but this eliminates tremendous amounts of funding if you build it yourself. Uh, this is, well, this is a spin-off from Bias for two, actually, but, uh, but also from that uh, savanna we found water is a huge shortage. So in Biosphere 2, we built a complete water recycling system. And now this is being used in remote Aboriginal communities. Um, to go there, a uh, simple one. Well, then there is um, the biome of the city, that is to say the human habitat. And so for that, we decided that London was probably uh, the most interesting human habitat. And if you could build a habitat that could live and deal in London, uh, then this could later on be applied to a biosphere for the human habitat there. This gallery was also to increase our studies of the ethnosphere because it was based on what we called artists of the trans vanguard. The Western avant-garde was the, uh, the Rangement Systematique du Sang of Rimbaud, the systematic arrangement of the census, which is basically done by the introduction of industrialization. But, uh, so now there is a trans vanguard in Africa, in China, in many places. There's an avant-garde 
who is not imitating the European avant-garde, but is actually also deranging their previous sensibility in order to systematically deal with the uh, impact of uh, the technology. Then in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, for the rainforest, the Biosphere 2 eventually, we were then going to put rainforest biomes in it and so forth. But a different, this is a thousand acre reforestation project with the Departamento de Desarrollo in Puerto Rico. And uh, the idea is to actually uh, grow logs so close together that they, uh, with the existing trees, that you don't have to clear cut at all. You can put them in and, and uh, grow through them. Uh, okay, well, the, a quick design of Biosphere 2. Uh, what, what would be a, a minimum adequate uh, model of, uh, of a biosphere? Well, we thought it had to have the basic biomes of uh, deserts, grassland, rainforest, marsh, coral reef, agriculture, and humans. Of course, from planet Earth, those are divided up. Some belong in the Arctic region, some in the uh, uh, higher latitude, and some at the equator. But we chose basically an equatorial approach to this. And we chose it uh, as after complete global warming, which has occurred on the planet before, but all the ice is gone. So we, it's a two-phase system. We didn't include the ice system in it, but it went back and forth between the water and uh, again. Now, people say, well, how, how can you finance such a thing like that? Well, this is the kind of thing, by the way, which uh, you cannot study in the United States. It's not illegal, but you'll find people will be terrified to discuss noospherics. Uh, the only country that really, from the establishment point of view, that pushes that is uh, Russia, and to some extent China and Japan. Well, the, the invention of it was, uh, that uh, you have an information rise that comes out of it. Tremendous new information. It's a research center on particularly uh, ethnosphere and biosphere. And of course you have to then design a technosphere that can actually hold that uh, together. Now you also have uh, DNA, that is you have a really uh, completely uh, enclosed system where you know exactly what the genetic material is there and so forth and so on. So there's also interesting DNA out and information out. Yeah. Next one. Biospherics, the science of closed ecological systems, that's Vernotsky, the founder, and that's Claire Fulson who was uh, NASA's leading exobiologist, and he had proved that you could have these little microspheres, that's closed, and um, it would support itself indefinitely with algae, with just the input and uh, putting in of the light. But of course, biosphere two was to have all of the kingdoms of, of life, which is five or six, depending on how you count them. And this was the first uh, human experiment, that is, uh, complete recycling waste, air, um, everything inside of that system. Uh, then when that, uh, that passed, and I didn't suffer any real, uh, ill effects, then we got the okay to go ahead and build a, the biosphere. Are we going to you might want to take a three-dimensional look at it. Because actually, to, to study things like biospheres, you need a, really a four-dimensional. There's all three dimensions of space and the dimension of time. Those globals, those are the, uh, they kept the air pressure the same inside as outside. So otherwise, it would explode or implode. This was all done with the advanced Bucky Fuller uh, geometry. So you know we didn't have to follow strictly the dome, but at this time new advances had been made. That was the library. Um, and this was all part of the human habitat. Now this, we're talking here in the you know, 19, uh, 
89 design. This is, this is not a 3D animation. So that was the, the first paperless office, and Toshiba donated the, all of the, the material for that. This is the agriculture. Now, the agricultural biome supported eight people for two years on a half an acre. It's like 5,000 people a square mile. This aroused the entire ire of the establishment. That is to say, the agricultural scientists to say you have to have more and more and more uh, fertilizer. Uh, no fertilizer being applied to that. And uh, that took about uh, four hours a day for the cooking, the, the entire, everything connected with food, uh, five days a week. So then that left plenty of time then for uh, life, uh, uh, cultural life, technical life, and so forth. This is if you were uh, a reader of Edgar Rice Burroughs and you sail in uh, over the coral reefs in Mombasa and then you hit the marshes and then you hit the savanna and you hit the desert. And if you had come back the other way to start with, you would have hit the mountains of the moon in Uganda. Now, the U.S. Park Service donated most of these uh, uh, plants. That's because nobody was certain whether or not you could take those plants and, and raise them uh, once they're destroyed, say, in the city development. This is the technosphere. And the idea H.G. Wells had, the technosphere should be put under the ground. Uh, life should have the, have the uh, above the ground. Now, the difference between uh, Russian science and American science is extraordinary. And among all the other great brainwashings that happens to us in America is the brainwashing about Russian science. I'm not referring to communism, I'm referring to science. Like uh, Mendeleev, for example, the periodic table. And then what they call it is cosmism. That is, science should deal with subjects that are cosmically important. And then uh, Mendeleev had a great student named Dokuchayev, and he classified soils on a base totally different from the United States Geological Service. Uh, I trained in geology, so I, I know, know both of them. The USGS is, uh, rates it on the, what is the sand, the soil, and the, the physical component. This is very good if you manufacture chemicals for agriculture. Dokuchayev classified the soils on the basis of the role they played in the biosphere. The different ecology, or, uh, ecologies, uh, biomes in different kinds of soil. Uh, there were 2,000 meters, so this was monitoring uh, all of the changes in the atmosphere. This is what I call the dance of life and light. So some of you, of course, every CO2 is pretty hot now, uh, but everybody mainly looks at it, uh, looks at it as a symptom. So the problem is not the CO2 rise, the problem is the system that creates that as one of many detrimental results of it. And in a sense, it's just a total mask. The, the major problem is, the, uh, of course, the pollution that comes from increasing population with increasing amount of goods per person and increasing amount of waste on that. So you have three exponentially going forces and whatever somebody might do by relieving the symptom, even if you took down CO2 1%, it's the total system that's causing the disaster. 
And this shows it to you, it really worked out. Because you can look at Biosphere 2 as a microscope, so you can see uh, how as the uh, carbon dioxide goes up, the amount of life goes uh, down, and vice versa. It's a, a, a daily dance and a, a seasonal dance. Yeah, well, the main, the main cost of biosphere, of course, was about 50 million to make where nothing could go in and out <laughs> through a hole. <laughs> now, look at this mangrove. This proved that mangroves could be taken and uh, even raised in elevation and grow very, very well. People really were worried so many mangroves had been cut down. Could they be restored? Thank you. Uh, the government of Mexico donated the coral reef, and then we set up uh, uh, coral reef studies down around Acomal to, uh, with, and Cornell came in to see how long it would take to, for the uh, little ones to grow back, which were at, at different intervals. And this is really interesting. It shows you the advantages over personalismo republics and our kind of mass voting republics. Uh, it's against the Constitution to take material out of Mexico. So, how do we have reps from Mexico? Because it, it went through and they said, well, this is going to be very beneficial to Mexico and ecology and everything. So, we will have a decree made that this, this is part of Mexico. <laughs> just because I mentioned Mexico and you hear something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, hello, hello. Well, let me see if I can uh, go back to, uh, back to the time when I was a labor organizer. We didn't have any of that kind of crap, but we had to communicate to an audience by the projection of the voice. Yeah. <laughs> Next one. Yeah, this is uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's Lost World. I couldn't resist it. So that's the rainforest from uh, Guiana. And uh, many people think that's where evolution starts. It's the most favorable, uh, and then it's the, a, a new species would work its way down to the rainforest. And then it would survive that, it'd work its way to the savannah. Then it would survive that really tough sun, like that bone. He would go in and survive the desert. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, up here is the, uh, yeah. The next one. That, that was the kitchen. I got the, the architectural prize actually for the best kitchen of the year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next one. Now, um, one of the ways you could check on the health of the biospherians was was there a light in the library at night? So that was put at the top of a big stairway. So if anybody got weak, there wouldn't be any light up there. Okay. Next one. The external labs, uh, that, each one of those had like a micro study, like a micro rainforest and then uh, savanna that we worked on for three years before going and putting the one inside. This one uh, is what we're doing now, which is relationship of soils in the closed system. Uh, you may see there's a lot of differences of uh, opinion and so forth about CO2 and everything. Well, remember those are all computer equations. And there's one big place where we really don't know what's happening, and that is down in the soil. <laughs> now, nobody wants to study it, just like nobody wants to study the pharmaceutical company's patents. Nobody wants to study the fertilizer patents. Mm -hmm. These are the two huge dynamos. That uh, one of the reasons why you don't hear anything about biospherics. So that's uh, that's that system. This wheat was an interesting experiment. The Russians had the wheat two two years in a row in space. They sent it to the Chinese. They, the Chinese didn't have any material, so they gave it to us to see whether space made any difference in the genetic of uh, the two generation. As you can see on the right there, um, it looks like things go very well in space for reproduction. 
Oh yeah, that's uh, that's Jim Cameron. Uh, so Jim sat in on a couple of meetings, uh, and let me say he is, he actually is a real engineer. <laughs> he can really think. And uh, this is his uh, painting of our proposed Mars base. And the reason why they're that size is you can fit them on the back of a shuttle. So you would have here the technosphere and the humans and the atmosphere. Uh, basically, we think that would support uh, four people indefinitely. We will have some Q&A here, uh, so hold your questions. Um, I just want to take a second to thank Andy Fuso and the Jellyfish Gallery for hosting us here tonight. And um, I also want to welcome our viewers from around the world that are watching on Earth Dance TV and the Earth Dance Network. And uh, 